Um, welcome everyone tonight. Uh, I'm Dave Van Zant, the president here at the New School, and this is a wonderful opportunity for us to host a talk. I, uh, this talk by Emory uh, Lovins. He is one of the world's leading experts on energy. Um, he's someone who's doing so much to promote uh, a vision for the world without fossil fuels, you know, without climate change, and with safe, affordable sources of energy. Uh, I want to thank our new school trustee, Mike Johnston, um, for putting us in touch with Emory and encouraging him to come here. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, I think this talk is symbolic. This is the anniversary of, 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 um, of Hurricane, uh, Hurricane Sandy hitting us last year, and I think it's uh, interesting we're doing it right now. I mean, that was an event that really brought home to us uh, climate change in the, New York, in the New York area. And the fact is that, that things like that are only going to increase unless we actually take some positive steps to, uh, positive steps to address it. And you know, it's one of the reasons all of us here are at the New School. We're here because we want to make changes. We want to make, uh, be creative and innovative in how we protect our planet, protect our ourselves and everyone and make life, in li make life better uh, for everyone. So um, this is uh, very interesting to have this talk tonight. Uh, and um, I look forward to hearing it. And I, I welcome all of you to the New School. So let me turn it over to uh, Joel Towers now to introduce our speaker. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the New School. I'm Joel Towers. I'm the Dean of Parsons. Um, and our speaker tonight actually needs no formal introduction, because I think you've all come here for the most part because you know him already um, and have um, followed his work, participated in his work, uh, called on him for advice and consultation in your work, probably. Um, I certainly know that uh, I have over the years, and I was reminded um, just recently when I was telling uh, David Van Zant about the first time I met Amory, which is almost 25 years ago now, uh, when um, then working for Bill McDonough, an architect, uh, and being asked um, to lead a project that would uh, try to conceptualize sustainable design and um, how it could be used as a tool for um, designing the World's Fair for the Expo 2000. Uh, at the time, the city of Hanover had just won a competition to host that World's Fair. It was 1990, and they were committed to doing um, a green World's Fair, which is an oxymoron. Uh, it, it's, it's, you really can't do it if you count up all the energy cost. But um, nonetheless, uh, we got that task, and I directed that project, which became the Hanover Principles for Design for Sustainability. And the first thing we did was to call Amory and say, what do we do? Uh, and he was a critical, central part of helping us conceptualize that work and evaluating it. And um, that later became Cradle to Cradle, that work. And um, Bill's office uh, has taken off doing very important things. But Amory, as always, was there at the very beginning. Uh, and I think many of us would have similar stories. Uh, and so when Mike let me know that Amory was going to be in town, I jumped at the opportunity to host this lecture. Uh, not just because we have many students at New School, Parsons, Lang, elsewhere that are really uh, Milano, that are focused on the issues that uh, Amory uh, so clearly um, uh, himself focuses on and leads, uh, but because it's an important talk across um, uh, for many different institutions here in the city, and we have many guests from uh, outside uh, New School, and we're very happy to have you here for this talk. Uh, and so w I don't um, think that I will read off the many, many uh, honorary degrees and all of the places that Amory's been. You know them all. Many of you have arranged for him to get them at your various different institutions. Um, but I will say that it is a, a deep, deep honor and a great pleasure to have him here. Uh, and without further ado, uh, welcome Amory Lovins to the podium. Well, thank you. After those generous introductions, I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, uh, I'd like to share with you tonight the findings of an ambitious synthesis of American energy solutions. I work at Rocky Mountain Institute. It's an independent, nonprofit, uh, entrepreneurial think and do tank that drives the efficient and restorative use of resources. And uh, 61 of us spent a year and a half uh, putting together the grand synthesis that I'll summarize for you tonight. Um, there's a whole lot more to it than I can talk about here. If we had a, 
if we had slides summarizing the analysis, there would be about a thousand of them, uh, many of which are actually on the website, uh, reinventingfire.com. And this work was published two years ago, and in fact, the paperback has just now come out, but I don't have it yet. Uh, it's a business book, very rich in cases and graphics. Do not get the Kindle version. You need the layout to understand it because it's so graphics rich. But there is a, if you want it electronically, there is a Google Books version that's kind of a PDF so you can see the layout. And uh, it actually has forwards by the president of Shell Oil and the then chairman of the biggest nuclear and third biggest coal-fired utility in the country, which may rather surprise you when you hear what it's about. Uh, in this country, we have a very peculiar public conversation about energy. And if you boiled it down and clarified it, it would be a stupid multiple choice test. Namely, would you rather die of A, oil wars, or B, climate change, or C, nuclear holocaust, or D, all of the above? <laughs> oh, I missed one. Or E, none of the above. That's the choice we're seldom offered. But what, what if we could make energy do our work without working our undoing? Could we imagine fuel without fear? Could we reinvent fire? And we chose this big poetic title because fire a long time ago made us human, then fossil fuels made us modern, but now we need a new fire that makes us safe, secure, healthy, and durable. That's now become feasible. In fact, it works better and costs less than what we are doing. So let's see how. Now, four-fifths of the world's energy still comes from burning each year four cubic miles of the rotted remains of primeval swamp goo. And those fossil fuels, I should tell you as a member of the National Petroleum Council, and it's true, have built our civilization and created our wealth and enriched the lives of billions of people. But their rising costs to our security, economy, health, and environment are eroding, if not outweighing their benefits. So we need a new fire. And switching from the old fire to the new fire changes two big stories, oil and electricity, each of which puts two-fifths of the fossil carbon into the air. They're quite distinct. Our electricity comes less than 1% from oil, about two-fifths or maybe now as little as a third from coal, but their, their uses are similarly concentrated. Uh, three quarters of the oil fuels transportation, three quarters of the electricity powers buildings, and the rest of both runs factories. So very efficient vehicles and land use and buildings and factories can save a lot of oil and coal and natural gas to displace both of them. But today's energy system is not just inefficient, it is also disconnected, aging, dirty, and insecure, so it needs refurbishment. <coughs> By 2050, though, it could become efficient, connected, and distributed with elegantly frugal autos, buildings, and factories, all relying on a secure, modern, and resilient electricity system. So, we can eliminate our addiction to oil and coal by 2050 and use a third less natural gas while switching to threefold more efficient use and three quarters renewable supply. And that's the transition I'll describe for you. And by 2050, we found this could cost the United States $5 trillion less than business as usual in net present value assuming that all hidden or external costs, carbon emissions or anything else, are valued at zero, a conservatively low estimate. <laughs> uh, but this cheaper energy system could support a 158% bigger economy, all without oil or coal or nuclear energy. Moreover, we found this transition would need no new inventions and no new federal taxes, subsidies, mandates, or laws thus end running Washington gridlock. Maybe that's the most surprising thing, so let me say that again. I'm going to tell you 
how we can get the United States completely off oil and coal, $5 trillion cheaper, with no act of Congress led by business for profit. This doesn't mean no policy is required. It means the policy changes we need can all be done administratively or at a state level, which is where we've long made most of our energy policy anyway. And <coughs> the idea here is to use our most effective institutions, uh, private enterprise co-evolving with civil society, sped by military innovation, to go around our least effective institutions. And whether you care most about jobs and profits and competitive advantage, or about national security, or about environmental stewardship, public health, creation care, climate protection, uh, reinventing fire makes sense and makes money. Now, General Eisenhower reputedly said that expanding the boundaries of a tough problem makes it soluble by encompassing more solutions, more options, more synergies, more degrees of freedom. Normally when we have a tough problem we try to chop it into smaller bite-sized pieces, but he said no, enlarge it, move the boundaries out until they include everything the solution requires, which is very good advice. And therefore in this work we integrated all four sectors that use energy, transportation, buildings, industry, and electricity. And we integrated four kinds of innovations, not just technology and public policy, which are important and normally assumed, but two others that are even more powerful and normally left out, namely design, the way we combine technologies, and strategy, new business models, new competitive strategies. And when you play with a full deck with all four kinds of innovation, you get a lot more than the sum of the parts, and you create some deeply disruptive business opportunities. Where to start? Well, in this country we pay two billion dollars a day for oil plus another four billion dollars a day for the hidden economic and military costs of our oil addiction. So let's see, six billion dollars a day, so that adds up to about a sixth of GDP. And uh, half of that oil goes to automobiles, so let's start by making autos oil free. Now. The physics of cars is such that two-thirds of the energy used to make it go is caused by its weight. And yet for the past quarter century our two-ton steel autos have suffered an epidemic of obesity and they gained weight twice as fast as we have. Uh, happily, however, uh, we now have uh, ultra-light and ultra-strong materials like carbon fiber composites that can make dramatic weight savings snowball and can make autos simpler and even cheaper to build. And lighter and more slippery autos also need less force to move them so their engine gets smaller and in fact the vehicle's fitness then makes electric traction affordable uh, because you need about three times fewer of those costly batteries or fuel cells. Therefore, the sticker price falls to about today's level and the driving cost per mile is much lower to start with. So this particular sequence of innovations can transform automakers from wringing tiny savings out of essentially Victorian steel stamping and engine technologies to the steeply falling costs of three mutually reinforcing technologies, the ultralight materials, their structural manufacturing, and electric propulsion. And if you're exploiting three steep and synergistic learning curves while your competitor is out on the flat part of one learning curve, you win. The sales of such vehicles can grow and their prices can drop even faster with a temporary fee bait, that is, fees for inefficient new cars paid for by re, excuse me, rebates for efficient new cars paid for by fees on inefficient new cars. And the biggest of six such programs abroad, uh, happens to be in France, uh, in its first two years tripled the speed of improving automotive efficiency. And this sort of thing can perfectly well be done at a state level. Now, the resulting shift to electric autos will be as game-changing as shifting from small refinements in 
uh, typewriters to the dramatic Moore's Law driven gains in computers. And of course, computers and information technology are now America's biggest industry. Typewriter makers have vanished. So, vehicle fitness, taking the obesity out of the car, opens up a powerful new automotive competitive strategy that doubles the normally expected oil saving over the next 40 years, but also makes affordable the electrification that can get the cars off oil altogether. America or China or Japan could lead this next automotive revolution. Uh, the barriers, which are pretty uh, hefty, are actually more cultural than they are technical or economic, and we're helping the industry uh, surmount them, uh, particularly with Detroit's new leaders. But the current leader is actually Germany. This year, Volkswagen has started low-volume production of this carbon fiber two-seat uh, plug-in hybrid car rated at 235 miles a gallon. Strikingly similar specs to some I rode in the early 90s. And Volkswagen is ramping up mid-volume production of this carbon fiber battery electric car. They've confirmed that its carbon fiber is paid for by needing fewer batteries. And their CEO says, we do not intend to be a typewriter maker because he can look across Munich to where uh, Olympia used to make excellent typewriters. Uh, Audi recently showed a carbon fiber plug-in hybrid concept SUV, very similar to one we designed in 2000 with the industry, and it's rated at over 250 miles per gallon equivalent. So we're off and running. And there are some interesting things that <coughs> American industry can bring to this party. I brought along my uh, carbon cap tonight, sort of 1916 Italian style. Uh, and uh, this is a test piece for military ballistic helmets that have been shipping for some years. Uh, the technology was developed by one of our spinoffs I used to chair. Uh, and the technology has actually just been sold to Diefenbacher, an excellent German tier one automotive supplier. So they plan to bring it aggressively uh, to, s to scale in automotive and other markets. Now, this little piece of carbon fiber and thermoplastic was formed to this shape in one minute seven years ago. And if I hit it, you can tell from the sound that it's immensely strong and stiff. Let's pass it around as long as I get it back. Um, uh, don't worry about dropping it. It's tougher than titanium. Tom Friedman of the Times actually whacked it with a sledgehammer as hard as he could, and he couldn't even scuff it. Uh, and if American automakers made all our autos out of this stuff, they get three times lighter. Uh, they need 80% less capital to manufacture. Uh, yeah, don't worry. You can <laughs> jump on it. It doesn't matter. Uh, <coughs> they would save a lot of lives because these materials absorb six to 12 times as much crash energy per pound of steel and do so more smoothly. Uh, and the oil saved as you scale this manufacturing to automotive cost and speed, which you can do now, the oil saved just in the United States is like discovering one and a half Saudis or half an OPEC by drilling in a very prospective play called the Detroit Formation. And the saved oil actually costs just $18 a barrel. That's to pay for the electrification. The ultralighting turns out to be free. More on that in a minute. And the, uh, the saved oil, the nega barrels under Detroit, are domestic, secure, carbon-free, and inexhaustible. Now, if you want to know why is the ultralighting free, you have to look inside that SUV we designed 13 years ago with a couple of tier ones. Uh, it's an uncompromised mid-sized SUV, uh, 67 miles a gallon on gasoline or uh, 114 on hydrogen. But if you look inside, you find there's only 14 parts in the body structure and anyone who knows aerospace will recognize this is an airframe. It's suspended from rings rather than built up from a tub, which is our horse and buggy legacy in the auto business. So it's immensely strong and stiff. Each of these parts 
uh, is made with one low pressure die set. Uh, a steel SUV body would have 10 or 20 times more parts than this, each made with an average of four progressive steel stamping die sets. So you just saved about 98 or 99 percent of the tooling cost. Uh, and each of these parts can be lifted with one hand and no hoist. The biggest part on the side I can briefly lift with one finger. Uh, and then the parts snap precisely together for bonding, uh, so you don't need the robotic body shop and all the jigs to hold everything together. Uh, and if you lay color in the mold, you don't need the uh, paint shop either. So there go the two hardest and costliest steps in making the car, hence the roughly 80% capital savings. And then because it's so light, you need two-thirds less propulsion system to run it. Uh, and all of those things together pay for the carbon fiber, making the ultralighting approximately free. The carbon fiber itself is probably also about to get a lot cheaper. Now, the unusual design process we used from the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works reportedly enabled Toyota to create this uh, concept car they showed six years ago. It has the interior volume of a Prius half the fuel use and one-third the weight. If this were an ordinary, not a plug-in hybrid, so if it were like most Priuses on the road, it would weigh 880 pounds, 400 kilograms. Uh, that's the current ultralight champion among publicly known carbon fiber vehicles. And lest anybody think they were doing this for amusement, the day before they showed it, uh, they had Torre, the biggest maker of carbon fiber, announce a large factory in, to in Nagoya to mass produce carbon fiber car parts for Toyota, not a phrase previously much heard in the industry. And then four other automakers later joined the Torre consortium, and the number two, Tejan, jumped in with its consortium of automakers. So uh, there are now 17 firms with processes for making uh, automotive carbon fiber parts. Volkswagen and BMW will soon gain some worthy competitors, and not only in Japan. Now, the same physics and the same business logic also apply to the second biggest oil user, the heavy vehicles. Uh, Walmart last year was using 44 percent less fuel than in 2005 to move a case of product uh, through better logistics and better design in its gigantic fleet of 18-wheelers. But it turns out just the technological potential for these Class A trucks is tripled efficiency. Logistic savings are extra. And <coughs> when you combine that with the triple to quintupled efficiency airplanes being designed at places like Boeing and NASA and MIT and Airbus, uh, you get almost a trillion dollars worth of net savings of fuel in heavy vehicles. So in both heavy and light vehicles, these innovations are being sped up by the military revolution in energy efficiency that I've been driving for about 30 years. <coughs> uh, and the civilian sector uses 50 odd times more oil than the military, so that's huge leverage. The way it would work, is working, is very much like the way military R&D gave us the internet, the global positioning system, the jet engine industry, the microchip industry. Except this time, <coughs> when you bring those technologies back to the civilian sector, uh, you're just getting our nation off oil a lot faster, and then we don't need to fight over the oil, and then our warfighters can have neg emissions in the Gulf, mission unnecessary. As an advisor to the Chief of Naval Operations, I can assure you that warfighters really like that idea. Now, as we design and build vehicles better, we can also use them a lot smarter. This is a graph of traffic congestion with the morning and evening rush hours. And if that were an electricity load shape, we would throw a lot of IT-enabled pricing and demand response and, and smart grid stuff at it to try to flatten out those peaks. But by not yet doing that for road traffic, we are wasting many, many billions of dollars in idle people, idle vehicles, and idle roads. But rather than just watching driving double as is officially forecast, contrary to recent data, uh, 
we can actually cut needless driving by four very powerful techniques. One is to charge drivers for the road infrastructure not by the gallon but by the mile. Another is to use some smart IT to enhance public transit and empower car sharing and ride sharing. Then we can allow and encourage lucrative smart growth and new urbanist real estate models so more people are already where they want to be and don't need to go somewhere else. And we can also use IT to make traffic free flowing. I'm not even counting in here, uh, you know, bike lanes and what Dave Brower used to say, all those who believe in individual mass transit, raise your right foot. Uh, <laughs> uh, but just these four proven methods can together give us the same or better access with 46 to 84 percent less driving. That saves another $0.4 trillion dollars plus another $0.3 trillion dollars from smarter use of trucks. So add all this up and 40 years from now a far more mobile U.S. society can use no oil. And saving or displacing each barrel at an average cost of $25 rather than buying it for well over $100 can save $4 trillion net present value. Uh, and if, if I had counted, which I didn't, just the hidden economic and military costs of U.S. oil dependence, that would be a saving of $12 trillion. That does not count any avoided harm in uh, health, safety, environment, climate, global development, global security, uh, or our nation's independence and reputation. Now, to get mobility without oil, to, to phase out the oil, we can first get efficient with the savings baked into the government forecast in Magenta, then the extra uh, blue savings from vehicle fitness and electrification and the aqua savings for more productive use of vehicles. And then those 125 to 240 mile per gallon equivalent or one or two liter per hundred kilometer autos can use any mixture of hydrogen in green, electricity in yellow or advanced biofuels in orange. The heavy trucks and the airplanes can realistically use advanced biofuels or hydrogen, or the trucks could even burn natural gas, but none of the vehicles will need oil. And any biofuels we might need at most 3 million barrels a day, compared to a total of about 19 used a day for all oil, uh, could be made two-thirds from waste and without harming uh, climate or cropland. In fact, we could pay the farmers and ranchers for taking carbon out of the air and putting it back in tilth where it belongs. Now, our little team at RMI speeds these oil savings by what we call institutional acupuncture, where the business logic is congested and not flowing properly. We insert little needles in selected points in partners like Ford and Walmart and the Pentagon to get that entrepreneurial juice or, or chi uh, flowing. And uh, this long transition is already well enough underway that even four years ago, mainstream analysts were starting to see peak oil, not in supply but in demand. Uh, <coughs> because uh, like whale oil in the 1850s, oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. But electrified autos don't need to add new burdens to the electricity system. Rather, when smart vehicles exchange electricity and information through smart buildings with smart grids, they are adding to the grid flexibility and storage that help the grid to accept varying solar and wind power. So electric autos make it easier to solve the auto and electricity problems together than separately, value of integration. And they also converge the oil story with our second big story, which you'll remember was electricity, how to save a lot of it and then make it differently. And those twin revolutions in electricity promise more numerous, diverse, and profound disruptions than in any other sector because we've got 21st century technology and speed colliding head-on with 20th and 19th century 
institutions, rules, and cultures. Now, changing how we make electricity gets easier if we need less of it. Today, most of it is wasted, and efficiency technologies keep improving faster than we can install them. So the unbought reserve of megawatts, saved watts, keeps getting bigger and cheaper. But as buildings and industry start to get efficient faster than they grow, uh, our electricity use, instead of growing as officially forecast 1% a year, down from 10 or so, can actually shrink 1% a year after allowing for the extra use by the efficient electric autos. And in fact, something like this is already happening only more so. Uh, adjusted for weather, the electricity used per dollar of GDP fell by an unprecedented 3.4% last year alone. And we, uh, we had peak electricity and peak gasoline use in this country in 2007. It's been drifting down ever since. So even as the economy grows, electricity use is stagnant or falling in most of the country and on average. And we can keep demand dropping by reasonably accelerating existing trends. Over the next 40 years, U.S. buildings, which I'll remind you use three quarters of our electricity, can triple or quadruple their energy productivity, saving $1.4 trillion net present value with a 33% internal rate of return. That is, the savings are worth four times what they cost. Industry can also accelerate and double its energy productivity with a 21% internal rate of return, also very juicy. And to get these done by 2050, we would just need over the next 17 years to ramp up national average adoption of efficiency to the levels that the Pacific Northwest states already achieved uh, eight years ago, whatever exists as possible. Now, there is a disruptive innovation that we call integrative design that we've been hatching for a few decades at RMI uh, that can do even better because it often makes very large energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into expanding returns. That's how our retrofit of the Empire State Building three years ago is saving two-fifths of its energy. Uh, first thing we did with our partners in ownership and Jones Lang LaSalle managing the property and Johnson Controls executing the retrofit was to remanufacture all 6,514 windows in a temporary window factory set up on the vacant fifth floor uh, and remake them into super windows that let in light but block heat and insulate sev several times better. And that plus better lights and office equipment and other stuff cut the maximum cooling load by a third. But that meant that we could renovate smaller chillers instead of adding bigger chillers. That saved $17 million of capital cost, paying for most of the other improvements and cutting the payback to three years. That's the same payback that a major energy service company had offered for saving six times smaller because they were going to optimize components by themselves, whereas we were optimizing the whole building as a system. Uh, we have some more recent retrofits in big buildings elsewhere that are now saving as much as 70%, making some old buildings better than new. So the state of the art is moving very fast. And if you go to retrofitdepot.org, you'll find out uh, some nice tools for looking at a real estate portfolio and learning how to do the right things in the right order at the right time so you can piggyback on other major renovations you're doing anyway and that makes it a lot cheaper. Let's try another kind of building, namely let's go look at my own house. Judy and I live <coughs> at 7,100 feet in the Rockies uh, near Aspen where it used to go as low as minus 47F, minus 44C. Uh, minus 40 F and C are the same. That's the freezing point of mercury. You better have an alcohol thermometer. Uh, <clears throat> and we've had as much as 39 days of continuous cloud there in midwinter. You can get frost any day of the year. We've had frost on the 4th of July. Uh, and yet, this building has no heating system. 
Uh, it was an archetype of the European passive house movement, which now has 30,000 odd buildings, which like ours, don't need any heat, but have roughly normal construction cost. Now, let's go into this atrium uh, under the R12 and a half glass, that is, it insulates like 14 sheets of glass, but looks like two and costs less than three. Another super window. And inside, this is what it looks like in a February snowstorm. You can, you can see two of the five banana crops that were then ripening. Uh, and actually, this is our 48th crop that just came out. These are crops 46 and 47, which um, came out around March and actually pulled the tree down. They weighed 30 kilograms. So our, our latest innovation is self-harvesting bananas. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so th this is all passive solar, 99%, active solar, 1%. Uh, and today's technologies are better than they were in 84, so we've retrofitted them. But when I moved in in 84, this house was saving 99% of the normal space and water heating energy, 90% of the household electricity, and half the water, all with a 10-month payback. Well, using so little energy, there wasn't a business case for retrofits, but I wanted to see how much better the new technologies were, so we put them in anyway, and we're now measuring 300 data streams to see how much better the new stuff is. The trouble is the measuring equipment seems to use more electricity than the lights and appliances we're measuring. <laughs> uh, now, the same techniques uh, can work in essentially any climate. Uh, for example, they've been used to eliminate air conditioning up to 115F or 46C in California in a house that's cheaper to build uh, and gives better comfort. They've been used to save 90% of the air conditioning energy in steamy Bangkok in a house that's, that has normal construction cost and better comfort. And just about everybody in the world lives in a climate somewhere between Bangkok and Old Snowmass. Uh, <coughs> And wherever you live, the key is integrative design that gives multiple benefits for single expenditures. So, for example, this white arch holding up the middle of our house has 12 functions, but only one cost. Now, integrative design can also increase the half trillion dollars of conventional energy savings in industry. Um, Dow Chemical, for example, has captured so far $9 billion of, of energy savings on a $1 billion investment, but there's a lot more to do. For example, three-fifths of the world's electricity runs motors, half of that runs pumps and fans, uh, and there's a lot you can do to make pumps and fans more efficient, and there's about 35 things you can put into a normal industrial motor system to save about half the energy with a one-year payback. But First, we ought to capture bigger and cheaper savings that are normally omitted, are not in any official study, and are not in any engineering textbook we know. So we need to rewrite the textbooks. For example, pumps. The biggest use of motors move liquid through pipes. And a typical industrial pumping loop was redesigned to use at least 86% less pumping energy, not by getting better pumps and motors and controls, often worthwhile, but just by replacing long, thin, crooked pipes with fat, short, straight pipes. So this is not rocket science. It's not even a new technology. It's just rearranging our metal furniture as designers. Uh, and when we did that trick in our own house, we saved 97% of the pumping energy in some piping we were putting in. And as usual, it was cheaper to build because the pumps and motors get so much smaller. Now, what does all this mean for the electricity that's 60% used in motors? Well, from the fuel, say coal burned in the power plant, there are so many compounding losses that only a tenth of the fuel energy comes out the pipe as flow. But let's take those compounding losses from left to right and turn them around backwards into compounding savings from right to left. And every unit of flow or friction we save here in the pipe compounds back again to save 10 units of fuel and cost and pollution and what Hunter Lovins calls global weirding back at the power plant. 
And of course, as you go back upstream, the components get smaller and therefore cheaper. Now, our team has lately found such snowballing energy savings in over $40 billion worth of industrial redesigns, uh, supposedly good designs to start with. Um, everything from this Hewlett Packard data center and Texas Instruments chip fab to Anglo-American and Rio Tinto mines and shell hydrocarbon facilities and so on. And typically our retrofit designs save about 30 to 60 percent of the energy with two or three year paybacks and our new facility designs save more, say around 40 to 90 odd percent with almost always lower capital cost. <laughs> Integrative design strikes again. Now, if you need less electricity, that makes it easier and faster to change how we make it, and especially to shift to renewables. China leads their explosive growth and their plummeting costs, shown here on a logarithmic scale for photovoltaic modules, solar cells, which are off the bottom of the chart now, and for wind farms. Um, and both of these in good U.S. sites now beat uh, gas power on levelized cost. Uh, so my own utility in Colorado is buying a lot more wind power and gas power, because uh, excuse me, wind and, and solar power, because they're both cheaper than new combined cycle gas power. In Germany, they've scaled their photovoltaics so much, uh, actually in their peak month, each of the past two years, they put in more solar cells than we did in our fourfold bigger economy in the entire year. That, uh, they've scaled so much that they've rung cost out of the value chain all the way through and their installed system cost for photovoltaics on your roof is about half what ours averaged last year. Uh, so of course there are time and motion teams from our outfit and others swarming around Germany to see how they did it and some of our entrepreneurs are getting uh, very good at it too. Uh, but even at our doubled average cost, uh, today in about 20 of the United States entrepreneurs will happily come to your house put solar power on your roof with no money down and beat your utility bill. And th that 20 is of course expanding. Uh, in fact, the, the value proposition may soon be not no money down but cash back to put solar on your roof. I, I'll bet that would further boost the adoption rate. Uh, and of course, solar is an unregulated product and together with a few other unregulated products, it could soon add up to a virtual utility that could bypass your power company just like your cell phones bypassed wireline phone companies. So that sort of th thing gives utility executives nightmares and venture capitalists sweet dreams. Um, there are a lot of intelligent ways the incumbents could respond to the insurgents. Ostrich is not one of them. Um, Actually, Margaret Jolly at, at Con Ed is doing some very good and interesting work in, in distributed power systems. And uh, the, our, our uh, electricity innovation lab, eLab that RMI has set up with 40 odd industry thought leaders, uh, is a safe place where the incumbents and insurgents can talk to each other and create mutual value rather than just lobbing grenades. Uh, so very interesting. Uh, opportunities are, are emerging there. But let me give you the big picture. Worldwide, every year since 2008, uh, half of the new generating capacity added worldwide has been renewable. And this graph shows the actual amount of wind and sol photovoltaic power added in, the year, in, in each year. This is not the cumulative total, which is just an exponential curve standing up on end. It's the rate of additions. And the, the reason this is going so fast, and actually solar is likely to cross wind this year, uh, is that these technologies scale utterly differently. The means of making electricity has now become a scalable, mass-produced, uh, manufactured product. It used to be that to make a bunch of electricity, you needed to uh, spend a decade and billions of dollars building a cathedral. <laughs> but now, in that decade, you can build each year a, you know, a, 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 a photovoltaic manufacturing plant, so that's a series of roughly 10 of them, each of which 
each year thereafter will produce enough solar cells that each year thereafter that one year's output from that one plant will produce as much electricity as your cathedral would have produced 10 years later. So the scaling is incredibly fast and that is why even though photovoltaics are only 1% of US electricity, they are scaring the daylights out of many utility executives because it completely upends their business model. Uh, the global manufacturing capacity is about twice the rate at which we're installing the stuff uh, and China, um, which created a lot of that surplus, is soaking it up by saying that by 2015, which is five to eight quarters from now, uh, they will have 35 billion watts of photovoltaics installed in China, and they tend to meet their targets. Uh, so <laughs> this is getting very interesting. And of course, the, the surplus capacity to make this stuff has glutted the market and crashed the prices, which is bad for the manufacturers, but great for the installers. For them, it's just a lower cost. Uh, so Europe has already made over a million new renewable jobs. And in this country, we have more solar or wind jobs than we have steel or coal jobs. That's today. Uh, <clears throat> now, worldwide, uh, each of the past two years, non-hydro renewables, mainly these two, photovoltaics and wind, have gotten a quarter trillion dollars a year of private investment and they've added over 80 billion watts. So they now have more installed capacity in place worldwide than nuclear power. They will pass its output over the next few years. Uh, and Actually, nuclear's uh, net additions went negative even before the Fukushima accident in 2011. And global orders for nuclear and coal plants are dwindling because they have no business case anymore. They cost too much and they have too much financial risk to interest investors. Uh, now, natural gas prices also remain volatile, but renewables and efficiency have no fuel, stable prices, and actually falling prices, whereas gas prices are volatile and rising. So these modern competitors have together already taken away 28% of coal's market share in the U.S. in seven years, 19% in the past two years. Uh, and they can displace all the rest of the coal at below the operating cost of existing coal plants and indeed of many if not most nuclear plants, 14 of which either operating or plant have been terminated so far this year because they can't compete with the wholesale price anymore. Uh, often driven down not just by gas but also by wind, especially in the Midwest. And uh, actually efficiency has been twice as important nearly as gas in reducing America's carbon emissions last year. So this is not just a gas story. We are often told, though, that only the coal and nuclear plants can keep the lights on because they are said to be 24-7, while wind power and photovoltaics are variable and thus supposedly unreliable. But actually, there's no such thing as a 24-7 power plant. They all break. And when a giant coal or nuclear plant breaks, you just lost a billion watts in milliseconds, half the time without warning and often for weeks or months. And that is why for well over a century we've designed the grid to back up failed plants with working plants. That's how grids handle the intermittence, the unforecastable failures of big power plants. And, and it's rather expensive because you need a lot of reserve margin and spending reserve to do that. Now, in exactly the same way, grids can handle the forecastable variations of solar and wind power and indeed, the National Renewable Energy Lab did an excellent study a year and a half ago uh, showing how to run an 80 or 90 percent renewable power system in the United States with full reliability and reasonable economics. Uh, but I want to emphasize that this is also feasible for smaller areas. And let me show you a little simulation that we did for 
the so-called ERCOT power pool, which is essentially the Texas grid, and it's isolated from both the eastern and western United States. So it's a particularly difficult case. In 2050, uh, that Texas grid is forecast to have a weekly load shape something like this. Uh, and uh, if you use the electricity in a way that the National Academy says is highly profitable, uh, the, the load would be smaller and less peaky, but still over 30 billion watts. So let's meet all of this with renewables. We'll start off with a bunch of wind and a bunch of photovoltaics enough to meet together 86% um, of the annual electricity needs. And I've used real data here to show you how variable they really are. Um, the other 14%, let's get from other renewables that are dispatchable. You can have them whenever you want. So that's geothermal, small hydro, uh, solar thermal electric, which stores enough heat to run into or through the evening or the night. Um, municipal solid waste combustion, burning feedlot biogas in existing combustion turbines, burning energy studies, that's my favorite. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can see that although we're 100% renewable, it's not a great match to the load shape, the dotted line, because sometimes we have too much and sometimes we don't have enough. So let's now take those surpluses and put them into two kinds of distributed storage namely smart charging of electric vehicles and ice storage air conditioning. That is, you make ice at night as many big buildings do and then use the ice in the daytime to cool the building. And the, these are now packaged units you can also get for small buildings. So when you add all that up, guess what? You can take that distributed storage, get it back when you want, fill in the last bits with unobtrusively flexible demand, and now all the moving parts fit together. You have reliable power every hour of the year. You have not used any bulk storage, which many people think is a prerequisite for doing much with renewables. Uh, <coughs> but we didn't need it, and by the way, only 5% of the renewable power is left over to be spilled, uh, and therefore the economics should be quite interesting. Now, some utilities are already doing this kind of choreography of variable renewables. Uh, Germany was the, the fourth biggest economy in the world, was 23% renewably powered for all of last year. Uh, and Denmark, 41%, mostly wind. Uh, for the first half of this year, uh, Portugal was 70% renewably powered, up from 17% eight years ago. These things can move fast. They also put electric charging infrastructure for cars all over the country in two years. Spain, the first half of this year, was 48% renewable, half of that wind power. So if you hear somebody say you can only do 5 or 10% renewable without the lights going off, tell them to buy a plane ticket and go take a look. Uh, the European grid operators are very good at what they do. Actually, Germany and, Jap and Denmark have the most reliable power in Europe. It's about 10 times as reliable as ours, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> and uh, with, with these kinds of precedents, uh, the vision of an all-European grid is uh, gaining momentum pretty rapidly to the great discomfiture of the uh, main European utilities which bet against this innovation and loss. This is not just a European uh, development though. Iowa and South Dakota are nearly a fourth wind powered right now. Uh, Texas early this year was nearing 30 percent wind on some days. My own utility in Colorado Excel reached 57 percent wind power for one hour. Uh, the lights again stayed on fine. Um, and half the new generating capacity added in the U.S. and over two-thirds in Europe last year was renewable. Um, in fact, the head of San Diego Gas and Electric says within just another couple of years, probably on sunny afternoons, all his fossil fuel plants will be turned off because there will be no demand for them. Solar will have taken that market. Now, <laughs> lest you think that variable the attribute of wind and photovoltaic power means unreliable. Let me show you some French data from the grid operator. This is for a very stormy month 
lots of big storms moving through Europe. And the red is the actual wind power output of France through the month, and the blue is the forecast of that quantity one day ahead. I'll bet we wish we could forecast demand that well. And actually, as you get within an hour or a half hour when you're fine-tuning your dispatch, it gets extremely reliable. The Danish grid operator says he can uh, forecast the amount of wind power he's going to have in a half hour with 98% accuracy, better than demand. Whereas if he presses the start button on a gas turbine, he has only 96% confidence that it'll be producing its rated output in another half hour. Interesting. And there's another fascinating thing going on in Denmark uh, and in many other countries, and that's the shift shown here over 32 years from a few big coal-fired plants to a constellation of zillions of uh, wind farms in blue and ag waste fed cogeneration plants in brown and about 86 percent of that wind power is owned by farmers in their communities. Uh, similarly most of the German renewable capacity is owned by communities, co-ops and, and individuals. Individuals own I believe uh, about a third of it. Uh, whereas in this country, which has policies favoring large corporate ownership, only 2% is owned by individuals. Uh, Denmark is also reorganizing its grid in a cellular architecture that makes cascading blackouts impossible. It's the same approach that actually Cuba used. They went from 224 serious blackout days in 2005 to zero in 2007 uh, by this method and uh, the next year two hurricanes in two weeks shredded the eastern grid and they were still able to maintain vital services in those hard hit rural areas. I don't think I'd like to live in Cuba but that's one of the interesting things we can learn from them <coughs> and it's of great interest to our military which is adopting a, a very similar approach in fact, in this country, we have this aging, dirty, and insecure electricity system, and we just have to replace practically all of it by 2050 anyway. So we could replace it with more of what we've got, or with new nuclear build and so-called clean coal, or with centralized renewables, or with more distributed renewables. Surprise, they all cost the same, within a few percent. But they differ profoundly in their risks around national security, fuel, water, finance, technology, climate, and health, seven kinds of risk. This is a risk management play. For example, our over-centralized grid is very vulnerable to cascading and potentially economy-shattering blackouts. They could be caused by operational problems. You've had some experience of that. By bad space weather, by bad earth weather, uh, by earthquakes in some places, tsunamis, um, or for that matter by physical attack or cyber attack, both of which are of serious concern with some recent uh, very worrisome examples. But that blackout risk disappears and all the other risks are best managed with distributed renewables reorganized in what are called microgrids, which normally exchange power freely but can disconnect fractally, reconnect seamlessly, run without the grid. My own house works that way. We had three power failures last month. We didn't notice. Our neighbors really noticed, but all our stuff that we needed stayed on. And that is the Pentagon strategy for its own power supply because they need their stuff to work. Well, how about the rest of us whom they're defending? <laughs> we need our stuff to work too. Uh, and uh, at about the same cost as business as usual, this resilient grid architecture of what are called netted islandable microgrids could maximize our national and community and individual security as well as innovation, customer choice, and entrepreneurial opportunity. Uh, Sandy's an interesting example. At that time, uh, New Jersey was the nation's number two state in solar power installations. They had over 1,000 megawatts of them practically all of which survived the storm physically, even the ones that flew away with the roof were often intact when they landed, but not one of the, those billion watts could be produced 
because PSE&G's rules required that they be hooked up so they couldn't work unless the grid was up. That's stupid. By using industry standard protocols to keep the linemen safe, but be able to isolate from the grid and keep your stuff running, we could instead wire them so they work with or without the grid, just like my house, just like a military base. And uh, I think that would add enormously to our resilience and help us get things back up and running a lot faster. Now, let me summarize the electricity story. Together, efficient use and diverse distributed, renewable, resilient supplies are turning the whole sector upside down. <coughs> Traditionally, utilities would build giant coal and nuclear plants, big gas plants, maybe a little efficiency of renewables. Uh, and those utilities were rewarded, as they still are in 35 states, for selling you more electricity. Just as dumb as it sounds. But now, especially where regulators, as they do in this state, instead reward utilities for cutting your bills, the investments are going other way up. The market shifts massively toward efficiency, renewables, combined heat and power, distributed storage, smart grid, ways to blend them all together reliably with less transmission and with little or no bulk storage. And that is most true in the 30-odd states where uh, efficiency and demand response bid head-to-head -head in the same auction against supply. And of course, the demand side stuff tends to win because it's cheaper. Now, I want to emphasize, therefore, and this is a lesson in both the oil and the electricity parts of this talk, that our energy future is not fate but choice, and that choice is very flexible. Back in 1975 or so, industry and government both insisted that the amount of energy needed to make a dollar of real GDP could never go down. So it was considered heretical when I said in an article in Foreign Affairs in 76 that actually it could go down several fold. Hmm, how are we doing? Well, it's gone down by over half so far. Uh, and today with much better technologies, integrative design, uh, smarter finance and delivery and marketing channels. We have a very clear line of sight to tripling efficiency all over again, and a megawatt today costs only a third uh, what it did in the early 80s. So <clears throat> to solve the energy problem, we just needed to enlarge it and integrate it. And the results may at first astonish you, they even surprised us a bit, but you know, as Marshall McLuhan said, only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries, he said, are protected by public incredulity. <laughs> now, combine the electricity and oil revolutions, and you have the really big story, reinventing fire, where business enabled and sped by smart policies in mindful markets can lead our country, or I dare say many others, off oil and coal by 2050, saving $5 trillion, growing the economy 2.6-fold, strengthening our security. Oh, and by eliminating the oil and coal, cutting fossil carbon emissions by 82 to 86 percent. Now, if you like any of those outcomes, any one or more will do, <laughs> you can support that transition without needing to like every outcome and without needing to agree about which outcome is most important. We can all have different tastes and preferences, different politics. Let's just focus on outcomes, not motives. And that can turn gridlock and conflict into a unifying solution to our common energy challenge. And those best buys also turn out to be the most effective solutions to the big global problems that hazard every country's security and prosperity. Now, our little nonprofit uh, helps smart companies and occasionally <coughs> other parties like governments to get unstuck and speed this journey via various sectoral initiatives and projects and we're getting more and more audacious with those. Of course there there is still a lot of old thinking around too as the former oilman Murray Strong said not all the fossils are in the fuel. Uh, <laughs> but. DuPont's former chairman, Edgar Woolard, reminded us that firms hampered by old thinking won't be a problem <laughs> because in the long run they won't be around. 
What I've described for you tonight is not just a once in a civilization business opportunity. It's one of the greatest transformations in the history of our species. Because we humans are inventing a new fire. Not dug from below, but flowing from above. I've even heard theologians talk about energy from hell and energy from heaven. And this new fire has very different attributes. It is not scarce but bountiful, not local but everywhere, not transient but permanent, not costly but free, and but for the uh, transitional tail of natural gas and a bit of biofuel grown in ways that sustain and endure, this new fire is flameless and efficiently used. It really could make energy do our work without working our undoing. Now, each of you owns a piece of that $5 trillion prize, and Reinventing Fire details how you can capture that opportunity. Uh, we've just partnered with <coughs> three leading organizations in or closely collaborating with uh, China's central government to bring this thinking into China's strategic planning process. And that's very exciting. They are very keen on it since they're burning more coal than the rest of the world put together and they just became the world's largest oil importer. They have very bad air, lots of other worries. And I think uh, this could be the right idea with the right team at the right time. But I'm just headed there in another week or so. Uh, so with, with the conversation begun at reinventingfire.com, let me invite each of you to engage with us, with each other, with everybody around you to help make the world healthier, richer, fairer, safer, cooler by together reinventing fire. Thank you for your good work and your kind attention. We have a few microphones around the room, and um, Amory will take a few questions. So uh, if you have some, it would be great if you could either, uh, I, I can pass this one around. There's one mic over here, and um, you can start right here. Um, a, a couple of related questions. Um, with all of the free energy that Europe is getting and everything you showed us, uh, why is their economy in such a bad shape right now? And the uh, Europe generally? Europe generally. Uh, because of the Euro crisis well, from Southern Europe, uh, Germany has the strongest economy in the region. They have the best, uh, the lowest unemployment since reunification in 1990. They have thriving exports. They're doing just fine, thank you very much. You may have read even in the New York Times, which had a horribly inaccurate story, September 18th on this, that Germany's being impoverished by high electricity prices. They just, they had some rookie reporters in that issue get snookered by a disinformation campaign, and they haven't bothered to fix it, although what I- What about Spain? What? Spain. Uh, Spain and Portugal both have serious economic problems, which are not because they invested in renewables. And actually, the Spanish government has done a particularly bad job lately making many retroactive changes to their renewables law, which will land them in court and uh, have made them utterly not credible to energy investors. So I think they've damaged themselves. Uh, Portugal uh, has been doing a lot better. Czech Republic just made retroactive changes to the law, really bad idea. And you know, we can understand how countries get under budget pressure because of macroeconomic issues unrelated to energy. But uh, <clears throat> anybody who tells you that anybody in Europe got in economic trouble in the macroeconomy because uh, they went to renewables is just talking through their hat. Actually, in Germany, the net macroeconomic benefits of their energy transition are not just far in the future. They are today on current account. They have 384,000 as of 2011, more now, new renewable jobs which often take people off welfare, put them into good work with salaries, paying taxes, businesses paying taxes, 